We'll start today by looking at our calendar. So we just finished quest number four. There are only five quests of the semester. You can see there's just the one left very near the end of the semester. Uh, today we are talking about problem solving, lots of word problems, again, where the problems involve quadratic equations. And then Monday coming up is our review day for exam number two, or test number two, which is on Wednesday. And that test covers everything since the last test, which was way back like a month ago. Classes 19 to 34. So it's a full period thing. It's worth more than the quests are worth. Uh, it covers more than the quests are worth, or it covers more than the quests cover. And it is happening this coming Wednesday. Any questions on the calendar? Okay. So we're going to jump in on page 66. But we're going to blitz through some of the earlier stuff here. Take a look at this graph that we've got, this parabola. Um, looking at the graph, we can tell what the x-intercepts are. What are they? What are the two x-intercepts? Negative 6 and 1. And we could find those numbers without the graph by taking the equation and setting it equal to what magic number? 0. So you can find them by setting the equation equal to 0. And then if you wanted to figure out where the vertex was, how would we do that? Add those two x-intercepts and divide by 2, right? Average them to find this number that's right in the middle. So we would take the uh, negative 6, and you add it to the 1, and you get negative 5, cut that in half, and negative 2 and a half sure looks reasonable for the x value at the vertex, right? Okay, so it turns out there is a much quicker way to find the x coordinate of the vertex, and so we're going to see that formula right now. Take a look down here at number, uh, where are we, number 4. Uh, for the, uh, skipping the first sentence, for the quadratic equation, and then there's the standard looking ax squared plus bx plus c. The x coordinate of the vertex is given by this formula, x equals negative b over 2a. x equals negative b over 2a. So let's give this a shot for the example we just looked at over here. x equals negative b over 2a. So negative b means negative what number in this case? 1 or 5? Negative b is 5, right? Okay. Divided by 2 times a, how much is a? It's 1. So we get negative 5 divided by 2. Was that the x-coordinate of the vertex? It's negative 2 and a half. It was. And it's a whole lot easier than um, finding x-intercepts, which meant factoring, and then averaging them out. So x equals negative b over 2a is our new favorite formula. And if you happen to know the full-blown quadratic formula, then this new vertex business is actually kind of for free. Do you guys see in here this part, x equals negative b over 2a? Yeah, it's like you ignore the discriminant, you ignore the plus or minus, and you just look at the other pieces of the formula. So x equals negative b over 2a is something you've seen as part of a larger quadratic formula. Okay, uh, let's take a look at number five. It says let's use our new formula to find the vertex of this guy. So we'll begin with x equals negative b over 2a. I think it's important to put the x equals because the vertex has two numbers associated. There's the x-coordinate, which we're going to find here, and then the y-coordinate, which we have to find separately. But it's important to know that this is the formula for the x only. So where it says negative b, what are we putting? We're looking at this, this new equation here. So it's positive 4 divided by 2 times 1. Everybody okay with the A's and the B's that we plugged in? So this is just 2. X equals 2 is the X coordinate of the vertex. I can't say that X equals 2 is the vertex. The vertex is a point and it has two numbers. This is the X number. 
if you know x is equal to 2, how are we going to find the y? Plug, plug it into the equation. The original equation says y equals blah, blah, blah with x. So we're just going to change all those x's to 2's. So it used to be x squared. It's now 2 squared. Minus 4 used to be 4 times x. Now it's 4 times 2 plus 7. Do we see it? we get here? Three is good. So that means that the vertex of this parabola is two comma three. It's a quick and easy process once you know how to do it. Any questions on any of the pieces of that process? Okay, so the rest of today is all about solving some word problems, and they're all going to involve the vertex. Now, we know that the vertex of a, an upside-down parabola, downwards opening parabola, is the highest point, and if it's flipped over, then the vertex is the lowest point. And it turns out that there are a lot of interesting problems where the answer is either the highest point or the lowest point. So we're going to be finding the vertex for a lot of parabolas for the rest of today. Let's take a look at number uh, seven. I'm going to go to Abby for number seven. Okay, so are we convinced that the graph of that equation is a parabola? What in the equation says, yes, that's a parabola? the t squared. And is that a parabola that opens up or down? Opens down. So I'm just going to draw a very generic parabola. It's not that one. To draw that one, you got to draw like five points and find lots of stuff. This is just a very general looking thing, but it opens down. Is the vertex here, in this case, a minimum or a maximum? It's a maximum. It's the highest point on the graph, right? And I think this is exactly what the problem is asking us to find. It says find the maximum height of the rock and how long it takes to get there. This is the point the problem is asking you to find. The problem will never be as straightforward as saying find the vertex. But if you see the word maximum or you see the word minimum, I think it's really just saying find the vertex. Okay, so we've got to find the vertex of this thing. So the first thing I'm going to start with is the formula. What's the very first letter in the formula? It's not B. It's X. I'm just really trying to highlight. This is an X coordinate that we're finding. And then the formula is this negative B over 2A. That said, there are no X's in this problem. So I'm going to cross it off and change it. Is it H or is it T? It's T, because normally it's X squared, right? So we're going to change this to T equals. I think it's important to know what we are finding, especially if the letter is not X. You've got to make sure you're clear that what we're finding here is a T, not an H. Okay, so let's plug in. Negative. How much is our B? 12 divided by 2 times. How much is A? Negative 16 is good. Okay, let's clean this up. So upstairs is negative 12, downstairs negative 32. Ultimately, I think we're just going to go to a decimal anyway, but let's reduce this to make it simpler. Uh, I guess 4 goes into both of those numbers. 3 eighths. Did I do that right? Okay. So is that 3 eighths the height or the time? The height? Alexa, what did you say? Alexa says it's the time. 
What is that? How do we know? Because it's t equals. You can't look at that number, that 3 eighths. It could be 3 eighths feet off the ground or it could be 3 eighths second, seconds. There's no way to know just based on the number which one you are finding. The only way to know is to recognize that this formula we're using is always x equals. But in this case, it's not x, it's t. So it's really important to put that letter over there. So 3 eighths of a second. What happens after 3 eighths of a second? It's going to start coming back down. That's the moment in time when this rock is at its highest point. It's the vertex that we're finding. So we found how long it takes to get to the top. What do we still need to find? How high it is when it's at the top. You know that 3 eighths seconds is the when. How do we find out the where? Plug it into the formula. The original formula it says h equals all this stuff with t. So let's plug into that formula. h equals negative 16 times 3 eighths squared plus 12 times 3 eighths. All right, so I don't feel like we should spend our time playing with fractions, but I do expect that we could do this kind of a thing without the calculator in a minute or two. Um, but let's just bail and use the calculator on this guy at the moment, just so we can move to the next problem. Two point two five. Is that time or is that height? That's the height because we started with h equals. What is the height measured in feet? So putting it all together, it takes 3 eighths of a second for this rock to get up to its maximum height of 2.25 feet. It wasn't thrown very high. Questions on that? Okay, so there's two new things in this problem. Number one is to recognize that this problem is really saying find the what? Find the vertex. It doesn't say find the vertex explicitly, but you need to recognize that that word maximum means find the vertex. And then the other new thing is this negative b over 2a formula. Again, it's not hard to use once you've just had a little bit of practice with it. Let's take a look at number um, eight. And we'll go to boo. Thank you. So here's our picture. So we're going to make this rectangular uh, corral here, and we're going to use one side as a river. Presumably the animals we are corralling can't cross the stream, otherwise the fence is kind of useless. And uh, we have 400 feet of fencing altogether. So my first task is to label this thing, but I don't want to just label it with a Y or an L or anything like that. I need to keep it with just X, just the one variable. You have 400 feet of fence altogether. How much have you used so far? 2x. So what expression represents what's left over? 400 minus 2x. OK with that? 400 feet, you have 400 feet of fence to use. And already you have used 2x of them on the, the vertical sides. So 400 minus the 2x is what's left over. What's that? Yeah, the two verticals are each called x. And so then what's left over for the top side is that 400 minus whatever that you've used already, 400 minus 2x. Lauren, is that okay? Okay. All right, so we are trying to enclose the largest area. We know the area of a rectangle is length times width. But let's use x's. So what am I putting here for the area? folks think of that. We're just multiplying two sides of the rectangle. 400 minus 2x times x. Length times width. 
Okay. Okay. So that's the area. And let's just go ahead and distribute that x in. So we get 400x minus 2x squared. And as soon as I see a squared, I say, oh, this is a quadratic thing. And my and normally my quadratic term, the x squared term, is the first term. So if I want to move that to the front, what am I writing first? Negative 2x squared and then plus 400x. Just to write it in standard form where the highest power is the first thing. Okay, so we've got our equation. That's the formula for the area uh, depending on how, uh, what the value of x is. There's one other word in this problem that tells us how to proceed from here. What's the important word in this problem that tells us where to go next? Okay, we've got to find the dimensions, length and width. What is it, Alan? Largest. That's the word. We don't just want any rectangle. We want the largest rectangle. And if I think about graphing this parabola, again, I'm just going to draw a very generic parabola. Does it open up or down? Down, because it's negative 2. So here's my very generic parabola. And if I'm looking for the largest point on the parabola, what is it called? That's the vertex. So this problem, again, is saying find the vertex, even without being explicit, calling it a vertex. Vertex. So you are going to be keying in to words like minimum, maximum, biggest, smallest, largest, least. Right, any of those words, you translate to vertex. That's the first letter in the vertex formula, x. Is x the actual letter in this one? Like in the last problem, we changed it to a t. x is the letter in this one. Okay, so. Negative B, negative 400 divided by 2 times negative 2. So that's 400, negative 400 over negative 4, which is 100. So that's the value of x, which is the shorter side of this rectangle. So how about we'll call it the width. The width is 100. How would we find the length? 400 minus two of those hundreds. Right? That's our formula for the the length, the top side, 400 minus 2x. Okay, so the rectangle is 100 by 200. And then the last piece of this problem is to find the area of that rectangle. Now we have two choices. There's an easy way because you already know the length and the width. What do I do with 100 and 200? Multiply them. So we're just doing length times width, 100 times 200, 20,000 square feet. But suppose that you didn't actually figure out what the length was. You just knew the width was 100, and you didn't want to go this route where you separately find the length. How would you find the area if you only know the width is 100?
Yeah, we've got our area formula up at the top. All this stuff in purple are ways to find the area. So we figured out that the width was x equals 100. So couldn't we just plug x equals 100 in for any of the, for all the x's in some of some purple equation? And so you could try that later. You'll get the same 20,000. But I think it's easier in this case, since we had to find the length anyway, to just multiply length by width. Questions on that one? Okay, let's move on to the next page. I'll go to Mariah for number nine. So let's pause for one second. Uh, true or false? The annual enrollment in elementary and secondary school, secondary meaning middle and high school. So if we just take a look at how many kids are in grades uh, K through 12 right now today, would you say that's about the, you know, like basically the same number like every year? Why would that number change? Population changes, right? If the U.S. population is bigger, then you probably have more kids in grades K through 12. So the U.S. population changing affects how many people are in school. Uh, and then even more specific than that, um, the U.S. population doesn't just change at some linear rate where it's like another million people every year. It's not that simple. Um, you guys know the baby boom generation is like this big group of people that were all born, you know, like within 10 years of each other. And so if you follow that group of people, when they were in K through 12, there was a big increase in the number of students in K through 12. But once they graduated high school, there was actually a decrease in the number of people enrolled in school, right? Because there are these different chunks of populations that aren't all the same. So here's our formula that tells us how many people are enrolled in K through 12 in any given year. Zero is 1975, one is 1976, et cetera. So what we want to do is figure out uh, when the enrollment was lowest and what the minimum enrollment was. So here's my very generic graph. What tells me that's a parabola? X squared. Does it open up or down? Up because positive A. 0.058 is a positive number. So here is my very generic version of that graph. Does this graph have a maximum point or a minimum point? As a minimum point, what is it called? Vertex. And in this problem, do you see a word that says find the vertex? Lowest minimum. Either of those words say find the vertex. Yes? Okay, so let's find the vertex. What's the first letter in the equation? X. X equals negative B over 2A. Instead of negative B, what are we putting? 0.162 divided by 2 times 0.058. All right, with numbers like these, definitely this is a calculator question. So 1.162 divided by 2 times 0 0.058. So 0 0.033, 034 maybe. Is that right? Just right? So here's the problem with like actual numbers because they're all messy. Is that sometimes when we type things into the calculator, we pay no attention to what the number might be and we just type it in blindly and write down what the calculator reports. This is not the right answer. Why? Why? 
Why do I need to do it this way? It's only dividing the 2 the first way I typed it in. It took the 1.1, it divided it by 2, and then it multiplied the entire answer by 0 0.058. The calculator had no way of knowing that the 0 0.058 was in the denominator. When we write it, it's easy to see it's in the denominator, but the calculator can't see that. And so these extra parentheses are necessary, and it's going to have a big impact on the answer. And so it's super important with these, number, with these problems with messy numbers that you are very careful when using the calculator. Because oftentimes, unless you're really thinking about things, you won't catch an error. Because you won't recognize a number is ridiculous when you're expecting messy numbers and you get one. Okay, so let's call that something around uh, 10. 10 point something, we'll just call it 10. Okay, so that's the value of x. Is x the enrollment? Or is x the time? x is the time. It says x equals 0 is 1975. x is the time. So we still need to find the enrollment, which is e. So how are we going to find the enrollment? Plug in the 10. 10 in for all those x's up there. 0.058 times 10 squared minus 1.162 times 10 plus 50.604. And because I'm so smart, I'm going to do that in my head, 44.8. See how smart I am? Sometimes students think I put the answers in the packet for your benefit. It's for mine. Okay, so you type that into a calculator, and if I wrote the answer key correctly, then 44.8 is what you get. So what does that mean? In a certain year, okay, it doesn't make sense to say year 10. It's not 10 AD. you got to think about what the X's represent. Zero was 1975. What is 10? 1985. In 1985. So I don't want to say just the enrollment was. I want to put one more word in there. This wasn't any old year. This was a very special year. What happened in that year? It was the minimum enrollment. It was the smallest enrollment. We've got our very generic blue parabola here. And you could find the enrollment in any year if you wanted to. 1985 is just any old year, except the fact that it's the bottom. So the minimum enrollment was 44.8. Let's see, is that students? No, it's millions of students. Questions on that one? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, if I want a sentence, I'll be clear that I want a sentence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and probably if I'm just looking for the numbers, uh, the, the test itself will have two blank lines, and it'll say when, and then a blank line, and then enrollment, and then a blank line. Yeah. Other questions? Okay, so let me give the quest back just to the folks that came in a little bit late today, and then I want to talk a tiny bit about the quest. Morgan, Raya, Victor. Okay, who else didn't get? Everybody has theirs now? Boo. You are. Okay, as usual, the grade is in the lower left. So, um, if you are feeling good about uh, how you are doing in this class in terms of tests and quests, then take a nap for like the next 90 seconds. But if you're not feeling so good about this grade or the past grade or your current standing in this class, then listen carefully. Um, there is still time left in this semester to make some positive changes on your overall grade. 
but there isn't a lot of time left in the semester. As I mentioned at the start of class, our second and final test is coming up on Wednesday. It's five days from now. And you can do a lot of math and make a lot of connections over the course of five days. The test coming up is worth more than this quest. And so it's a real good opportunity to maybe make up for a, a quest grade that you're disappointed in. For the majority of people that, um, that uh, are not happy with the grades that they are getting, I would say that simply putting in more time is probably going to yield better results. I'm not saying that to everybody, because it could be that some people are putting in a lot of time and still not getting the results. But I would, my, my instinct is that for most people that aren't happy with their grades, it's really just a matter of putting in more time. It's easy for me to say just put in more time. I recognize you have other classes, family responsibilities, work responsibilities, all kinds of other things that are taking your time. So this could be an easier said than done kind of thing. But if you can prioritize and put in more time between now and Wednesday, I expect that the results will come. I'm looking for an honest answer here. Raise your hand if, uh, so you guys know the um, practiced quest problems that are in the packet. So we, we had practice quest problems for, for number four. So raise your hand if you made an honest attempt at all of the practice quest problems for number four. Okay, so about half. And I'm not, I'm not judging, I'm not taking names right now. But if you didn't really make an honest attempt at all of them, then I think you shortchanged yourself. Even if you had no time to do any other studying, I would say bare minimum, those problems, number one, because they're oftentimes quite similar to the problems that show up on the quest. And number two, there's a video of me going through each of them step by step. And so even if you can't make the time to be here and find somebody in the studio or find me in my office or meet a peer tutor, if you've got access to YouTube, then you have access to me doing each of these problems. And so I expect that if you weren't one of the people that just raised your hand, if you go through the practice quest problems that you didn't look at before, you'll see problems that, that look quite like the ones that were on the quest. And if you don't know how to do them on the sample ones, then you're probably not going to know how to do them when you get here on the quest. So bare minimum, I would say, sample quest problems and coming up on Wednesday, a couple of pages from where we are, you will find the sample test problems. And again, videos of all of them on YouTube. Okay, so um, we're going to skip number 10, and we're just going to take a quick look at a couple of uh, clips on YouTube, not of me. Um, so I'm going to pause the video in a minute because I don't want to show somebody else's video on my video for copyright reasons. But if you wanted to check out any more of these clips, the links are there for you.